I said, look yeah. at my shirt, guys. Yeah, Phoenix, Oregon. <laughs> hey, everybody, how y'all doing? We're, it's a fantastic day to play with, but the sun is right in our eyes, so uh, apologies. <laughs> <laughs> You're supposed to set up the other way, the other way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so your timing, the light behind you. your timing is impeccable, Jesse, because I had a, an intro video to show all of our members some of your past work. So uh, um, let me show the video and then we'll, we'll jump right into a uh, conversation. Sounds good. Even a little paternalismo left in there. What you think you use brotherhood up like a shot of tequila? You just drink it down, it burns, makes you feel good. This punk has gone from a rival gang in River Valley. He's been coming around saying the truck was promised to him by my homeboy in prison. I don't have to put a bullet in me to touch myself. I'm going to show you how to walk. I know how to walk. You don't know how to walk. Just walk. Walk. Oh, I got it. I got it. I got it. Take her to her mother. She'll go free. We are praying for you. My dear sister. I just think people in town ought to know the full story on Buddy D. That makes two of us. Looks like you missed your connection. We were, we were coming to get you. Please. Sorry. Anara. Ah! Oh, I see. You know, so then as I developed my own style, you know, I became a player. The same thing uh, when I was in uh, a, a theater school. Nice. Been up a I don't believe you. Divided them equally amongst its biodegradable trash bags. But you're long gone now, carried north on the Gulf Stream. King's finally gonna give up the throne. Hey man, I said drive. I wear the crown. Never forget. Never forget where you came from. Pero yo sé algo sobre Will y a ti se te está pudriendo mucho más que la pierna. Soy un buen hombre. Close your eyes for a minute. I want you to visualize what you'll be doing ten years from now. Are you serious? I think you lost your mind. Well, you're not visualizing your life. What's wrong with you? $15,000? That's it. I'm not paying for school anymore. What? I suggest you start packing. Will somebody tell me mm -hmm. on the other side of the road there is a dream? Congratulations, sir, on an extraordinary career. That is, uh, that is very impressive. Wow, I didn't realize I'd been in so much stuff. I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's, I mean, that's one of the things about uh, what I've been able to do is uh, really hold out. I like to say that I've said no more than I've said yes, because I've really tried to uh, leave behind a career of characters that I would be proud to say I played, you know, uh, even the heavy ones, you know, they have to have something to them. Uh, and I think uh now looking back that that that's a pretty great clip and i i'm i'm kind of like okay i, I kind of did some okay stuff that i left behind so i'm hoping that other young professionals 
uh, look back at that and, and go, hey, you know what I mean? I'm, I've got a chance no matter where I come from. So, uh, and I know my grandmother's looking down on me in heaven going, you did it, grandson. So, that I'm proud of. Well, it's, it's been an extraordinary career. Of course, you have uh, some ties to Klamath Falls because you now have your name up uh, for eternity in downtown Klamath Falls on a historic marker for a film that you shot here in 2018, which is awesome. The, the shirt that, that you're wearing. So it's great to see you again. Thanks for being part of our Casper Union last month, too. That was a ton of fun. Yeah, that, that you know, Phoenix, Oregon, I'm still, I'm still pushing it. The other, uh, I had some discussions in LA and they're talking about you know this whole uh, streaming world and I said well I was in a little film last year that kind of was like the first one that did that and everybody looked at me like huh and so I looked it up just to, uh, to you know so I could still tell people where to watch it on Amazon and uh, I realized that they're still renting it it's still out there to be bought and so I was excited and so I kind of mentioned it in a couple of meetings that I was in so uh, it's great that I'm able to uh, to talk to you guys because I think Klamath Falls was a really, really important part of that film. Even though the name itself isn't, ultimately it is Klamath Falls, Oregon. It should be the name of the film because without Barry, without Hanscoms, without the Main Street, you know, without the ability to artists when they're somewhere for, for a while, putting their soul out there, to be absorbed on their off time, they want to know that they're somewhere that they can vibe, that they can feel good. And you know, Klamath Falls has that. Uh, it has that magical kind of quality about it. So we kept talking about some of the cast. Uh, we kept talking about, you know, we have to we have to film another movie here. So I've got a musical that I keep trying to convince the director Gary to to do with me, and he keeps saying, "Well, I don't I don't really do musicals." I got don't worry about that. I do musicals. I got started on fame. I know how to do that. Let's just do that. <laughs> well, that, that's fantastic. You know, uh, Phoenix, Oregon was the last one that was shot here. But uh, in the last couple of months, we've had multiple studios and directors contacting us uh, wanting to shoot here. We actually have two reports that are shot here later this month. So interest in this area is starting to pick up. And I think a big part of that is Phoenix, Oregon. The, the success, the the oddity of Phoenix, Oregon, became the number one movie in America through a, a fluke circumstance, <laughs> um, but a, a a fantastic story to tell. Uh, That's manifest destiny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The the odds of that. You know, I, I keep telling Gary and Ryan that they need to buy a lottery ticket or something. Because the, the chances Ooh, that happen. Yeah. I, th I think they blew their lottery wad on that one. But that's the one you want to blow it on, man, because this film deserves to be seen. And, you know, one of the things that happened is, you know, knowing independent films is that when he finished it and they didn't get into any major festivals, they were kind of like downfallen. And I kept telling them, I know what you have. I've been in this business long enough to know when there's gold there. You guys have a little piece of gold here. You just have to keep keep it precious and that therefore they came up with the idea of self promoting right a uh, little self distribution run and sure enough the timing of that uh, the support that they got nationwide for such a cool little story you know such a good film it just kept those juices flowing to the time when we actually were going to have a theatrical release but you know again what, uh, what Winston Churchill always said, you know, some people see uh, disaster and calamity, I see opportunity. You know, the beauty of it was is that people needed this story at that time. A lot of people really absorbed it because they were so panicked about what was going on and that the theaters were closed and now they were shut in and then the, the fear of the virus that it became a kind of something that they wanted to absorb, that they needed to. And it was so out of the pale. And remember that none of the big studios were giving anything away. So that week, couple of weeks that everything got shut down, everybody was, what do we do? Let's binge watch everything we can, but there's only so much you can watch. So I think the feel good idea of pivoting, and I think also the spirit of saying, we're not gonna cut out those theaters. 
we're not going to cut out those theaters because those theaters were mom and pop theaters across the country that were going to show our little mom and pop movie. So we are not going to give up on them. So, you know, you don't get rich on a $6 ticket, but you sure are able to get the number one box office when all the theaters are closed. <laughs> well, so, and, and Gary and Andy also won a special award from uh, OMPA for doing charity work associated with the film, which is fantastic. Uh, in the wake of the horrific fires out in Phoenix and Talent, uh, and as well as the shutdown, they used the film to uh, raise money and charity for local restaurants that were shut down, local theaters, and then also for wildfire relief. So that's fantastic to see a film getting used for good uh, after the fact, too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's something that I call film activism. Uh, it's a phrase that I coined this past year because I had two films come out, one that I did 27 years ago that was ahead of the Latino curve, also with Benjamin Bratt. Uh, it's called Follow Me Home. So if you ever see, want to watch a good film this year, a film called Follow Me Home, the movie.com, and you can see the trailer. But that film and Phoenix, Oregon were able to screen and use that uh, viewing to be able to give back to the community. You know, Follow Me Home was about uh, helping people get out the vote. And Phoenix, Oregon was about uplifting the Phoenix community and letting people know in Oregon that we were behind them. We also did a great screening of Phoenix, Oregon for the ARP community. Uh, so we were able to, you couldn't have done that with a studio film. It would have been too much bureaucracy, too many naysayers. Uh, they don't give anything away. And so I think the fact that not only was it a successful release of an independent film, but we were able to share it in so many ways that uh, just increased the viewing uh, capacity of the of the actual film. And that's ultimately what you want as an independent film. You're never gonna get enough publicity and advertising, the millions of dollars that it takes to sell a dumb uh, a superhero movie, right? However, a film like this, which has real characters and, and real value, you know, in the story itself and, and represents who we really are as Americans uh, in a true just, brotherhood, sisterhood, community type of story, that's what you need to put all this advertising money into. So that's always a challenge. So I think uh, being able to control that tempo and to continue to push it and say, hey, look, keep watching it, keep watching. We have a whole international audience that's been waiting for it because we've been doing these uh, fame reunions in Europe. And we had just done a big one in 2017 uh, after we'd finished filming, uh, I'm sorry, in 2019, right after we'd finished filming the movie. So I kept telling all my English and European audience, oh, I've got a great film coming out, Phoenix, Oregon, you're gonna love it. If you love my you know, fame work, you're gonna love this. And they're still waiting for it. So there's an entire, you know, there's an entire Italian, British, Swedish audience that's waiting for this film. Also Latin America, you know, one of the things I did with, uh, Louis G, the uh, Louis Rodriguez, who played my nephew, uh, Rudy, he's one of the producers. So I told him, I said, look, there's an opportunity to maybe show at a film festival in Mexico. Why don't we, because we, sh I mean, Gary wrote a beautiful, beautiful depiction of the Latino culture. Uh, he didn't patronize us. He made us look wonderful and giving. I think that it'll sell in Mexico you know, with the Latin American audience. And so we went ahead and went through the hassle of subtitling it. So we have a subtitle, Spanish subtitled version. So I'm awaiting, uh, you know, the go ahead and we'll probably get another great, you know, viewing run in Latin America. So I think when you have a movie like this and it's independent of all that bureaucracy, that money-making, you know, mechanism, then you can play with it. And I think that's what I saw with Phoenix, Oregon, and this other film, and it just really excited me because, as an independent actor now, because I say no, like I said, to a lot of to a lot of these negative uh, Latino stereotypes on television. That means I usually don't work a lot, so I wait wait for something like Phoenix, Oregon, to come along, and the opportunity to work with somebody like Gary and Annie, uh, and a lot of those incredible actors. And that's when I knew we had something. When I saw what James Legro was doing with Bobby. 
when Lisa Edelstein showed up and they had a relationship and I saw how they were. And then next thing you know, we're waiting around then Diedrich shows up the third week and he's our boss and we just clicked off of that. And now we're waiting to see who's going to be Al and now Kevin Corrigan shows up. That's when I knew we had a hit. And I kept telling Gary, I said, look, I know you're tired because you're producing and directing your movie. But when you get, when you relax off of this, rest a little bit and you get it into the editing room, you have gold here, my friend. And he reminded me of that when he was editing it. He called me back and he goes, man, you were absolutely right. These people did incredible jobs. I said, yeah, you've got a movie. You've got a hit there if you can just find a way to sell it right, you know. So I'm glad it's had the success that it has for them. Fantastic. Well, we, we've got a very eclectic group here tonight. Of uh, We have some filmmakers with us. We have some teachers. We have a student. We, we've got a photographer, uh, 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 some actors. So uh, a nice group here, and I want to give them an opportunity to, to uh, ask some questions. But yeah. first, um, why don't you explain how you actually got into the film and television industry? Well, I was um, a theater actor in my uh, barrio, my neighborhood of San Antonio, Texas. A uh, young Chicano kid had learned uh, music from listening to my father's uh, albums. He was an accordion player uh, in the Tex-Mex uh, genre. And so I'd listen to his songs and, and learn them. So I, I'd get into the choir in school. And, you know, I was just doing it in school. And then I was lucky enough to get into uh, a local uh, college that had a theater program. Um, and so that kind of got me into the uh, thinking that I could do it as a professional. And then I got an opportunity to go to California Institute of the Arts there in uh, Valencia. And, you know, it's mostly known as an animation school, but they have a great theater program. And I went to school with Don Cheadle, uh, Bruce Beatty, actors like that. Um, but at that time, in the 80s, fame was a really big show. So they had an open audition. It was like the first American Idol type of audition in the industry. They had an open audition. You didn't have to have uh, any representation or be in the union. And we all showed up. Thousands of us showed up to MGM there. And we basically had to sing and dance. And if you could made it past those auditions, then you got a chance to audition for a character. And uh, when I auditioned, actually, I, I was living at the school and I didn't really have, in those days, there were no cell phones. And, you know, as a, as a poor acting student, you, could have, you couldn't afford a phone. <laughs> so I left them a picture and I left them uh, an address and that's all they had. And, and I think they lost that. And then consequently, uh, they had a Polaroid that they'd taken of everyone. And so they were flashing the Polaroid and said, if, if anybody knows this guy, <laughs> tell him to call the producers of fame. So I almost lost the job for the lack of technology. But eventually somebody saw it and reached out to me. And then my friends who had a phone across the hall, they called and they hooked me up with the callback audition. And once I got in, well, uh, it, you know, I just I just was myself. And uh, they saw that that would, have be, that would be an interesting character. So uh, we were the new kids in fame. Me, Janet Jackson, and Mia Peoples were the new kids. Uh, on the television show fame and that started uh, my acting career because it was uh, three years of a, of a television series and it was a very instructional Debbie Allen was just starting to direct a lot uh, she'd been choreographing and she was executive producing now so uh, she took me under her wing and I learned a lot about uh, film uh, you know acting on film uh, film coverage behind cameras and I started to learn my film language over those three years so uh, it was it was like film school. It was the best place to be uh, in terms of being a young actor getting into the industry. That's fantastic. Um, well, does anyone have any questions for Jesse? Chris, do you think this is getting across the class with Sierra? That you were both uh, song and dance and thought maybe you might have crossed the class and made sure she, she was doing it. Look at the mic over here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, speak, speak into the mic, David. <laughs> What's your first Texas career? You started out as a song and dance band. Did you cross paths with Selena? Pasadena or where? But, uh, the, the singer, Selena. Uh, yes. As a matter of fact, Selena was a famed fan. Her and her brother, again, seeing a Mexican character on television singing and dancing, they were young kids. And even though in South Texas you had to wait until one in the morning to see it, 
uh, because it was syndicated, we were one of the first syndicated shows to be produced in syndication in the country. Uh, and, and Selena was from Corpus, but the Tejano scene was in San Antonio. So Selena was already, Selena and the Dinos were already performing in San Antonio when I would go back there to work with the youth programs and stuff like that. So we wound up overlapping uh, she, the, the couple of years before she passed away. She was very, very big in the scene. And she gave back a lot to youth media programs. So we wound up performing together at a couple of uh, youth programs that were, we were giving back to kids who had passed uh, their grades or who were involved in some sort of a youth performance program. So we overlapped a couple of times. And then she was always gracious when I would see her at awards. Uh, she was always very kind to me and always said hi to me. Uh, and more than anything, I became close to her brother and her family because of the, because of the scene uh, when she passed away. Unfortunately, a lot of the that community in Texas, that music scene, they kind of all came together. And then when they produced uh, the Selena movie, a lot of the crew members, because they filmed it in San Antonio, a lot of the crew members, my brother was on the crew, and a lot of the crew members were people he'd gone to school with and people that I trained in the local San Antonio film scene. So there was a lot of overlaps, um, a beautiful spirit you know, that we lost. She worked with a lot of people that I, that I knew, David Byrne, the Barrio Boys, so she did a lot of stuff outside the box, you know, um, but a lot of that spirit and that energy is still there. Uh, and so I work a lot with a lot of those uh, music programs. You know, she's inspirational. So I try to take those those uh, germs and I try to see where we can where we can flower them, you know, where they'll grow. Um, but you know, I believe a lot of that a lot of those a lot of that talent is still there. It just has to be developed, you know. Uh Jesse, are, are you based in Texas now or LA? I'm in I'm in both. I'm mostly in San Antonio, Texas, but I do a lot of business in LA, so I do the I-10. I do the I-10 corridor. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to shoot something in Oregon. I keep talking. I've got two or three projects that we're trying to develop where I want to go back. I, I just really love the way the Oregon Film Office supports their filmmakers in Oregon from top to bottom, you know. I was so impressed when I went to the Ashland uh, uh, Festival that a lot of the people that had worked as crew were actually had, they actually had films as directors or as filmmakers, as DPs in a lot of the other places. So, and I think it's the same with Klamath Falls. You know, one of the things that excited me was knowing how strong you guys are, you know, as an identity. And I think keep that going, keep that going, always, always represent, represent who you are. And remember that that's, that's what makes us proud. And that's what, that's what keeps me coming back uh, is knowing that I believe in something that's, that's, that's very real and authentic. And San Antonio is that for me. And people ask, well, why aren't you in, in San Antonio instead of Hollywood? And they go, well, first of all, the price, uh, the price of the cost of living is a lot cheaper, right? So come on, first. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I was guess. in I was in Hollywood for twelve years before I moved to Southern Oregon, so I know all too well. Ooh, I've been I've been here a week doing some business, and I'm ready. I'm like, man, I've spent my whole month's overhead and check in San Antonio here in one week. What am I gonna do next week if I stay another week? <laughs> so. But you know the but but the reality of it is is that you know my family's there, my dad's music is there, uh, the river, San Antonio River is there, and so there's this kind of uh, root, you know, that I think feeds the creativity and the, and the expression, and that's what was cool about being in Klamath Falls is it, it really felt like every day we could create, you know, that there was. There was a there was a good vibe there, you know. I don't know if it's. Uh, I was trying to find out what the. Uh, I think the 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 Klamath, right? The Klamath are uh, are the peoples that are there, the native peoples. Because uh, I asked uh, one of my native elders, I said, well, "Who are the people that are there, so that I can, you know, honor them and just thank them when I go there?" Because I'm going to be doing my art there, which is like a prayer to me, right? And he goes, "Well, I think it's." Uh, he goes, "Where are you going, Klamath Falls?" He goes, "I think it's the Klamath." Because I think they're called the climate there, but there's other there's other groups that are there that overlap. 
but so uh, you know, a couple different tribes, but they, they're all they're all collectively called Klamath tribes. Yeah, right? there you go. So I think that's what he was referring to. Uh, and so uh, and so to me, I, I felt that that their spirits are they're still there. They're still telling us, tell your stories. You know, don't worry about it. Keep telling your stories. So I would say that you know, take that spiritual part of it to your filmmaking. Remember that it's an art. And there was this great article that uh, Martin Scorsese, who was my first director, right? If you ever get it, if you ever want to watch my first film after television, watch New York Stories. So New York Stories is three films based on a best-selling book by the same name. And it's the directors are Martin Scorsese, Woody Allen, and Francis Ford Coppola. So that is a crazy, and they each direct a short film. Uh, and I'm in the Martin Scorsese piece with uh, Nick Nolte and Roseanne Arquette. That was my first director for Christ's sake. So I had to really be thankful for that and to go, thank you. This is where I'm supposed to be. So I always take that to heart. But what? A, but a great article that he just had in Variety, where he said that calling everything content now is the death of cinema. <laughs> so even though I, I, I'm hip, but I'm calling everything IP content right now because everything is. There's no more movie and film. Those words are archaic. It's actually internet protocol content. You know, that's the sad part. The good part is that it's all still based on cinematic technique, skill, and narrative storytelling. So if you still think that way, if you still love old movies like I do, if you still absorb old scripts like I do, which is the best, the best scripts are still those old ones that you see in those classic movies. I'm sorry, nobody writes like that anymore. But when you see those things, you realize that you, you can still, those, those aesthetics are still what's important in what we do, even if they call it content, even if we're streaming it, even if we're shooting it on our iPhones and smartphones, just remember that aesthetic in whatever you do. And, you know, even when you're watching films, you want to understand that uh, and you'll see how the new styles and techniques evolve. But, you know, the narrative is still the same in terms of how you tell that story. That's why it impacts us so quickly because it's moving pictures, you know, and that's more of a, the new thing's going to be three-dimensional pictures, right? You know that, that you'll watch your film in three dimensions right in your living room. Well, and, you won't, and you won't need goggles like you do now. So yeah. that's going to be the new thing. Uh, so, but, but we already dream like that. We already think like that. Any, anybody who, you know, the death of, uh, of reading is horrible because to me, I don't care. I love Lord of the Rings, the movies, but it's nothing compared to my Lord of the Rings when I read the books. Nothing. Uh, and that's the truth about any great film that's been made that was knocked down from a book. When I read the book, there's no way because this imagination is what's there. And now with these Marvel movies and all this technology, they're making it seem like they can recreate all this stuff and it's reality. But it's still about the story. It's still about characters. And that's why I think the little movie that was made in Klamath Falls was the number one film in March when all the theaters were shut down because there wasn't <laughs> kind of full immersion. You know, you know it's, it's funny that, that you mentioned Marvel and old movies. This morning, I was giving a lecture to some high school students in, in L.A., uh, and one of the things that came up was, you know, action scenes and, and stuntmen and whatnot and talking about how to get in, into the industry. And I said, look, if you want to see the world's greatest stuntman, watch a Buster Keaton movie. Oh, God. Yes. Oh, yes. I, I, oh, go back to the silent movie era and watch Buster Keaton because it's you know, you'll see things where today you're still wondering how the hell did he do that? Exactly. No, they took risks, man, you know. You see those horse stunts that they do in those old westerns? Come on, man, those were the real dudes. Well, and yep. as, long as, as long as we're talking Oregon-made films, his greatest film, The General, was shot not too far away from here. Really? Yeah, that, yeah, in the film, when the two trains collide towards the end head-on, that was shot here, and those were real, honest-to-God steam locomotives. There you go. It's even an Oregon film history. I love it. Is there a plaque on that one? Yeah, it's got to be a plaque for that yeah, one, right? Oh, yeah, no, that, that film is on every list of top 100 movies ever made, easily top 20, so. Fantastic. 
Gone with the wind. Yeah, I can see that here. Something Bill Moore, like double or something like that. That was fun. They tried to make a reboot. Oh, oh, I think we just oh, lost. Okay. Oh, there you go. Oh, oh, hang on. Jesse. Yes. Hi. I'm an actor, and I saw Phoenix Rising. I have not seen Bill and Wendy this year. You were hands down my favorite character in the entire movie. <laughs> I felt like you were the linchpin to the heart of it. You were the one that everybody kind of circled around. So, as a fellow actor, I'm fascinated. What is the one thing? Do you have a one go-to thing to get into your character? Uh, I think you have to listen when you read a script. I, when I read a script, the first thing I do is, uh, I think of the entire story. I don't think of my character. I don't think, what am I going to do? I'm already go, I'm reading Bobby. I'm reading Tanya. I'm reading the stage directions, you know, uh, and, 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 and asking, you know, asking uh, guidance from the director is a big part of it, you know. So I think someone like Gary, who's a writer director, is great because usually they're separate, right? You're asking the perception of the director for his visual language, and you're asking for the writer for his, you know, uh, dialogue language, storytelling language, and you're trying to synthesize those two into absorbing the story. But I start with the story first. Then uh, once I'm getting the story, now I start to listen to the other actors. I start to listen to the other characters. You know, I start to listen to their voices. And that usually informs me as to uh, what I'm supposed to do and be. And I think once you figure that out as a team player, and I think this comes from having been raised in the theater where everything was collaborative and everything was ensemble, you know, you were creating an entire creature sometimes and you were just one cog of that in a theatrical piece so there was no eye in theater you know oh, wow there really is no eye in theater <laughs> <laughs> wow there really is no eye in theater but but you know what i mean so i think that served me well when you get into the world of film where everything's about you know my close-up mr demille which is important because i think a person's uh film performance has to be tailored from a very internal external you know and i think theater is more external to internal you know uh i think what i do is i'm able to do both simultaneously because of that and it serves me well because it gets me to a more authentic place a lot quicker especially when you don't have a lot of rehearsal times for films you know and usually in theater you rehearse a scene over and over so you physically get the hang of each other's space in a film you're blocking it you get maybe a couple of passes, you know, if you screw it up, you do multiple takes and that's your rehearsal. But ultimately you gotta get to a real authentic place fairly quickly, you know? Uh, so trust is a big thing. And I think the way to trust is to know everythingness. Not know it necessarily, but listen to it. There it is. Not know it, but listen to it. And now you're looking at the camera angles. Now you're looking without invading everyone's particular aesthetic and their work process you know which is very important very collaborative but i think filmmakers appreciate that not only directors but dps if you involve them in your process you're asking them what the frame is you're asking if you can see what they're seeing now they feel engaged and that helps you as an actor get into your zone which is what you're going to need to be when it's action you know so all of that is, a, it's a lot, but it's kind of, it's still relegated on kind of like centering yourself and absorbing everything in a, in a good, positive way. But the script is there. So if you follow the script and you know what you're shooting and you know where it is you're supposed to be at that time, then all of that then becomes play. And it isn't as stressful as trying to keep all that in your head. Now you really are just listening because you know your stuff. You know what you want to do. And, and you can switch because the other actor is going to need to do other things if you listen. You know, it's never going to come out the same. If you're being true as an actress, you know, if you're being true as an actor, the lines that you think are by rote are not. Every single time they'll be different. But that's because you're listening, you're absorbing, 
you know uh every close up you know should feel a little deeper a little lighter a little different you know you don't have to do it different there's some actors that do 20 takes and none of them are the same and they drive you know Benicio del Toro they say that he drives editors and directors crazy cuz every you know i stay in the zone i hone you know i play with like if i felt a little too honed then i'll break it up a little on my next take uh, but i kind of stay in the same area because i know what's required of the scene you know but that's 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 listening that's knowing stories and listening to stories you know and loving to tell stories so i think that's that's more than anything where you're going to find your zone does that answer your question perfect fantastic um how about uh, some folks who are on the call here i've not had a chance to talk yet uh, any other questions for jesse hmm hey this is court yeah i got a question uh first uh, I salute you, Jesse, because I too am an alumnus of Cal Arts, though I think I was there about a decade before you. Cal Arshan. Yeah. What school were you in? Uh, uh, music. I, I stood with uh, Subotnik and Hari Har Rao. Yeah, man. Yeah, back in the, yeah, that was when it was still wild before they got it tamed. Yeah. Hey, were the uh, were the. Uh, were the West Africans there yet? Uh, for a while there, they had, man, they had this incredible teacher. I don't know if he's still there, but he was doing a West African drum and he had a big drum corps there. So he must have not been there when you were there. Was no, just no, it was mostly a lot of Indian stuff going on. You know, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So that being, that being said, here's my question. Um, you know, I saw a lot of your early stuff but it was really when you did uh john sales lone star play that character danny uh that was when i started really paying attention to you and and i've read i've read that script and i mean danny is this right he's this character who i mean he he holds the whole narrative's feet to the fire i mean he's truth to power you know throughout it and i just thought that character could have been so big he could have been too big and i just felt like your performance was like letter perfect <laughs> you know uh he was really believable uh he was harsh but he wasn't he wasn't like an asshole or something you know yeah it's really and, and i just thought there was so much subtlety in that that that's why i started really paying attention to you i mean did you find a lot of that in the script or, or were there a lot of things that you felt you, you had to bring to it? I mean, the beauty of it is, is that John Sayles is such a good filmmaker and writer that unfortunately he knows exactly what he wants when he needs it. And you're right, man, that character could have been, could have had its own track. But mm -hmm. I think that because he was trying to tell multiple stories within the film narrative, so it wasn't yeah. just Chris Cooper's and and, and 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 Elizabeth's story, it was, you know, it was uh, the soldier and his dad. It was, you know, it was the mom and the immigrants. It was the backstory of Buddy Deeds. So there yeah. was so much, dude, there was, and that was the cool thing about it is that it was, wow, this cast of so many great little actors with great little scenes. So in that sense, I was, when John asked me to do it, I, I, and I knew John, I said, man, this is, dude, you're, this is like literally two days of work for me. You know, are you sure? And he's like, he goes, man, yeah, dude. And I said, you know what? Yes, it's a beautiful cast. And that's exactly why I go, I love the words that the character saying. Mm -hmm. But I was there for like two, three days, man. You know, I was. Yeah, but you made an impression because after that, I started seeing everything you did because yeah. I was so impressed with that. Yep, but I really love whenever act, uh, whenever directors uh, go to where they're filming and live there, live it, you know. So I wanted to be there with them in Eagle Pass for the two months that they were there is what I'm saying, you know. Mm. I really wanted to be part of the process. I wish I'd been there just hanging out like a fly on the wall, even if I wasn't. And that's what I really love. So I think that the uh, as much as I love that part, it felt like bittersweet because I was literally there like two days. And John is such a great director. Did you see the other film that I did with him with Edward James Olmos? Check it out. It's called Go Four Sisters. No, I, I haven't seen it. 
check it out. I play one, I do one scene with Eddie in that one. That's a one or two. But the 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 two black actresses that play the leads are incredible. You'll recognize them from other stuff. They're not that well known. Mm. But it's about it's about two ex-friends who have to go look for uh, one of the sons who's gotten involved with uh, drugs in Mexico. And so I was his partner, and so I have vital information. But they have to go to Edward James Olmos, uh, who's a retired police officer, to take them into Mexico. And it's all about their relationship. So it's a beautiful, but they, you know, when they say, oh, they could go for sisters, you know, oh, yeah, they look, they, look, they could go for sisters. So that's what it means, go for, go for yeah. sisters. But it's John Sales again. But oh, yeah. Right. So, yeah, his writing is so spot on. So that was the great thing about working with John. But unfortunately, I didn't have a studio. I should have just gone and hung out on my own time. That's what I should have done. <laughs> but, yeah, but I think, again, this is what I tell you, Court. I hold out for those people. I hold out when they show up. To me, they're like little jewels. So I mm -hmm. have to make sure that I serve them. Of course. Yeah. Is kind of cut cut out. Your your sound dropped off all, all of a sudden, or at least did here. For, is everyone else still hearing him? Okay. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's uh, it's yeah, it's volume has dropped off. Yeah. Five G there. Anyway, better. Well, we can hear you, but not as well. Yeah. Are are you using yeah. a phone? Because uh, yeah, it, it's okay. It um it sounds it sounded like uh maybe the input changed on it or, or something Take, check your settings for a second and uh we'll, we'll get back to you sorry sorry to cut you off there but we we lost audio for you um what while jesse's wor working on that if uh maybe some of the, someone else has a question uh richard or joyce michael chris mary jane or heidi anyone who hasn't had a chance to talk yet mary jane froze well no um, she, no, she, 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 no mary jane's just being very still Oh, there you go. Smile. <laughs> Jesse gets back to us. Uh, is, uh, that one he just got with Eddie, or uh, was on Touched by an Angel? Uh, it. I mean, we we can hear you, but it it uh, it's, it's not. Yeah, it's it's muted. not nearly as clear. It sounds like something's muted or or something's off. It might just be the connection. Yeah, but possibly. Um, yeah. Yeah. Does it sound weird? Uh, I mean, it's it's soft. We can still hear you. It's just not as good. So I guess everyone turn up your volume a little bit. Yeah, you might have yeah. to hang up and reconnect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, see. See if I if you can d disconnect and reconnect to the call. Yep. Cool. Well, uh, once we get Jesse back on it, this is fun. So I'll, I want to make sure everyone gets a chance to chime in though and and talk to Jesse. So if people have have a question, give me a give me a wave or something so that uh, uh, I can make sure that that you get a chance to talk to him. Which movie was it that he said he was talking about? Eddie almost. Um. It, the film with Edward James almost it was uh, yeah it, it was go for something go, go, go for something in 2013 yeah okay so that's what he's the first one was it, this uh, his yeah. IMG is ridiculous by by the way if you if you haven't looked it up on online okay well this is the Wikipedia but also look at his IMDb it's it's about a mile and a half long so <laughs> <laughs> what you think? Oh, that that Is sounds better? Much, oh, yeah. much better, much better. Thank, thank you, Jesse. Uh, reconnections. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, I think Richard uh, had a question. I put, put in a thumbs up, right? Or, or was that just to a good sound? I was just saying he has good sound, uh, but oh. I've enjoyed the conversation. I don't have any questions, but it's uh, definitely uh, nice to listen to your your thoughts and hear how an actor works. So, thank you for sharing. Yeah, yay. I'm, I'm and, and, you know, the, the other thing is that uh, whoever's uh, filmmakers and uh, creators and dreamers and writers in Klamath Falls, you know, a lot of uh, actors 
get their feet wet, especially people that are just starting out, that want to try it, that want to do it, they get their feet wet in projects like yours. So it's very important to support that community, the film festivals, the screenings, because that's where people get feedback. That's where they get to see, you know, they get they get their juices out, they get their juices flowing. And I think that inspires uh, people to keep creating, you know, and to keep expressing themselves, you know, in whichever way they want to. Well, if you do happen to make another film in Oregon, keep in mind our film festival, Climate Independent Film Festival, is mid-September. So we would love to do a world premiere or, or uh, something special if, if you do manage to come back at some point. So cool. Mid-September? Mid-September, September 17th through the 19th this year. We will do it virtually as well as in person. So I love it. And our festival is exclusively made in Oregon films. So we, we did Phoenix, Oregon for the 2019 Film Festival as our feature film. But every year, we only show made in Oregon films. Love it. So um, I, I'm curious about something, Jesse, from something that you said earlier. Uh, and I was thinking about this coming into the, the, this interview because when we talked before, you talked about how much you appreciated how... Um, how the Latino community was represented in Phoenix, Oregon. Um, and uh, we, we talked about that at the cast re reunion as, as well as tonight. Uh, and I, I totally get how certain stereotypes can come up in, with certain ethnicities on film. And certainly Hollywood has a grand tradition of casting white actors in, in, uh, in minority roles. I mean, hell, John Wayne even played Genghis Khan oh, once. I, I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, the, the whole... Uh, history of like blackface and, and and everything that's gone on in Hollywood for years. It's nice now to see that there's a pushback against that. And there's a cultural shift of um, wanting to have actors in certain, uh, you know, like uh, you know, changing certain actors if there's a white actor in a race. And I, you had mentioned something about elders. I, I didn't know, I have Native American heritage. Yeah. Um, well, you know, most Latinos in the Southwest, anyway, uh, have some sort of indigenous blood, even okay. if they're considered uh, Mexican American, uh, and you claim Aztec blood, you know, which everybody does who's Mexican American. I have Aztec blood, but you know, that's mestizo, that's indigenous. Uh, but the reality of it is, in Texas, uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of the people from Texas have Apache blood, Comanche blood. Um, uh, Coahuiltecan, the Coahuiltecos are the ones that were in the Texas uh, mission areas. They're the descendants of the missions. But you know, you have the, uh, in Arizona, you have a very strong native identification. So, you know, there's a lot of crossover in the Latinos and the Native American okay. heritage. Yeah. I, I was thinking about that because you have portrayed a couple of, you've been in a couple of Native uh, American roles feature films, The New World and the Tecumseh film. And I was wondering if you would, if you identified as Latino, how you felt today, if those were roles that you would take with all of this, this cultural shift of, of not wanting um, you know, actors from another race to portray characters, if, that, if you would still take those roles in The New World or Tecumseh today, as opposed to when, when they were shot amidst all of this cultural shift towards not wanting to have um, actors who are not of, of the same race playing the, those, those roles. Is that a cultural <clears throat> shift that, that you're seeing? And, and uh, would you think twice about those roles or would you still take them? No, I would think more about playing, which is what happened uh, after 9-11. There was a lot of uh, Middle Eastern roles. And because, you know, a lot of people from, especially the Canary Islands are from Spain, you know, Spain was Moorish. So, you know, there's, there's some... Uh, uh, Eastern Arabic features and people say from from Spain, you know, that has bled into the the Latin American look. I think uh, so. You know, sometimes I'd get offered Arabic uh, auditions, and I, you know, I'd say, look, first of all, they shouldn't be writing these types of characters for people of Arabic descent. Second of all, you sh they should let them. You know, they should actors, Arabic actors, people of you know, Middle Eastern descent. They should be auditioning for these parts. Native American is different because, like I said, many Latinos identify Native American, uh, in espe especially when, even in 95, when I did Tecumseh, 
I had to prove that I had Native American blood. So I had to get affidavits from my grandmother that my great great grandmother was Apache. Uh, I had to get affidavits from my from my father that where his family was from um, uh, were Zapotecan and Mexican uh, from Monterrey, uh, and then Texas Indian, the Coahuiltecos. So we had to actually do paperwork to prove all that. So it's interesting because there are Latinos who won't identify native, who don't think it's the same thing, but it's actually the opposite. There is actually more Native American blood in Southwestern. And again, I'm talking about Latinos from this country. And again, there's a big discussion about that because it's con you consider that all Latinos in this country come from Mexico and come from South and Central America. But the reality of it is in, in the Southwest, uh, a lot of the mixture of the Spanish culture and the indigenous culture in the first 300 years was what created the Southwestern population. So you're talking about New Mexicans identify, you know, have some native blood in their Spanish side. Some Californians have that. Again, by that time, by the time of Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, by the time of the great expansion of the West into the what used to be Mexican territory, those populations already identified nationally, Mexican, California, and New Mexican. But the reality of it is they had indigenous blood, even if they didn't identify specifically that. And remember that during a lot of the early or the later Spanish West, it was illegal to be Native American in some places. So try to pretty much dress or act Native American, especially if you'd already married into the missions, uh, which is what happened a lot in, in the Southwest. Uh, and once they married into the missions, they stopped with the Native traditions and cultures. So they lost their indigenousness. So now a lot of the 20th century, especially for actors of color, is re-identifying with those aspects of you. So one of the reasons I was able to go out for those characters is because I do identify Native American in my, uh, in my profile. So, and as a matter of fact, there was a, a radio DJ in San Antonio <laughs> who pointed that out. He goes, hey, this is young Chicano kid from the South Side. You know this guy, Jesse Borrego? What's he doing playing a Native American? <laughs> so yeah, it's, a, it, it's something to think about, but I think, uh, it would be less an issue with me auditioning for a Native American character uh, and also pe being part of being part of an actual Texas tribe now that identifies and that has uh, is identified by the state of Texas. So there's also a kind of legality about that, too. Um, but, you know, you don't want to bring that up and say, oh, yes, I'm card carrying. Oh, yes, I have, you know, one sixteenth blood of Geronimo or, you know. So it's not about that, it's about representing who we really are. And that culture, that indigenous culture, especially in a Chicano culture, the indigenous symbols that we use are identifiable because they come from our indigenous heritage. You know, even if you're going Aztec symbolism, if you're going Mexica, Texcocan, Zapotecan, which is really just south of the border, it's all an American culture that has been identified as an indigenous tribal way of identifying your culture. So I think that's the fun part of being an actor. Right now what I'm doing is I'm, uh, I'm developing a production company that's developing Latino narratives, but there's a whole side of it that's specifically geared towards developing Native American films as well. And there's no separation between the two. You know, of course you wouldn't say, yes, I'm gonna hire Edward James Olmos and all of the Latino cast, the best Hollywood actors to play Native Americans, you know, but there is a crossover, I think, in some, some actor's identification, you know. Uh, if you look at the guy who was in Apocalypto, uh, Raul Castillo, who played the main Mayan, main guy, right? His name's Raul Castillo, but he identifies Native American, he has Native American blood, I know his people and his tribe, but he also has a Spanish surname and I, you know, was raised in Tucson, Arizona. So you see what I'm saying? There's a lot of 
in the Southwest, there's a lot of that understanding of the crossover of those cultures. But I think that if you identify specifically Spanish and say, no, I'm from Spanish blood, and I'm, which some people, which some Mexican American people do, uh, you know, uh, Castilian or whatever, then you really don't think of the Latino and the Native American being the same culture, you know. Uh, but the reality of it is in the Southwest specifically, again, I'm talking about the Southwest, it really did uh, intermingle. The same way that if you would say anybody that identifies Native American from the Northeast probably has some sort of English, French, Canadian type of blood, you know, um, and that's the beautiful thing about this country. And I think that's why it's really, really interesting that we try to find the, the splitting of the hair and yet we're more alike than we realize. When you look at genetics, you know, the whole, uh, uh, the DNA strand, right? I think like 99.5% of us is the same. Mm -hmm. And that 0.5 is mm -hmm. what identifies us physically. So that's our whole racial makeup that we think separates us is 0.5 of our actual D DNA. So yeah, it's an interesting discussion and, and I would definitely, you know, I would definitely be very excited about those types of discussions. Like, you know, should Latinos play Native American? Should, you know, uh, I'm very interested to see, you know, what'll happen in, in the future because there's a very strong sense of what people want to be. You know, but the, but the, but the wonderfulness is, is that we're, we very, we're, we're very, we are a mixed group of wonderful cultures, you know? And well, just, just I, uh, you just mentioned uh, the Northeast tribe. I'm on eight Algonquin, but looking at me, you wouldn't know it. Yeah, you know, exactly. So, so uh, 10% Native American. Yeah. Native American sister, yeah. So it's, it's there, we're, um, to use the common phrase, it's a real melting pot here in this country. It's a real melting pot, yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> Which makes it really fascinating that right now there's so much pushback against uh, maybe it's more so against white actors because of the long legacy in Hollywood of white actors playing non-white roles. Last night I watched a 1952 film called Land of the Pharaohs. Mm -hmm. Joan Collins, it's an amazing film by the way, Joan Collins play, played an Egyptian princess. I guess they had to completely dip her into a vat that died to get the skin color right. Because <laughs> she's, she's as pale as can be. Well, and then- hey, like, That controversy is still there. You know that uh, Wonder Woman, what's her name? Um, she wants to play Cleopatra. And so there, there's, controver there's controversy still. I think the controversy that she doesn't understand is that quite possibly, uh, even if she was Macedonian, that the strand of Macedonian was probably over and over and over mingled with Egyptian, you know, Middle Eastern blood. So I doubt if she really would have looked Greek, you know, necessarily. Yeah. You know, but you, but you don't know. Again, we weren't there, so yeah. what do we know? All we all we see is what's on freeze and stuff like that. But even that kind of tells us a story. It's like, yeah, I was kind of. We are kind of having to dip people in vats of color to make, to tell stories that we know are wonderful. So I think that what we need to do as storytellers and story watchers is celebrate the culture. You know, and again, that's what was so wonderful about Carlos in, in, in Phoenix, Oregon, is I didn't have to do anything. Gary had already done it. And he didn't try to override it, you know, there was, but again, that's a tribute to, uh, to, uh, uh, to Louis Rodriguez, you know, the producer and their relationship is that they had a really good back and forth and that Gary could say, look, should I give him an accent? Should I, you know, I don't know if this, those discussions went on, but if they did, I know that Louis was there to say, nah, man, you know, let him be himself. But all the more reason to have somebody like me portray him because that's really what I want to do. I want to show who we are with all the flavor. Yes, we don't hide the flavor. Sure, you know, I code switch all the time, you know. Uh, my favorite character that I just did was on the third season of Fear the Walking Dead. Watch the third season of Fear the Walking Dead. Uh, the storyline goes into Tijuana. We're fighting over the Tijuana uh, water, right? Well, my character is like the Obi-Wan Kenobi of the zombie world. 
and I'm just trying to get people the water. I even bless the zombies when I kill them. It's a very, it's a beautiful character. And I do this, the, the, I come in in the fourth episode of the third season, but we made American history because it was the first time a primetime American television show was all in Spanish. Oh, nice. Wow. Yeah. Very, very and it cool. was so understated, but it was so cool. And how did I do that? By just being myself. By actually playing a true-to-life Mexicano, Tijuanero, you know, and we were we were filming in Mexico. We were at Baja Studios in Rosadito. So we were actually filming in the Tijuana streets. So I kept asking the, the Tijuana people, hey, am I representing you guys right? But at the same time, knowing that an American audience was going to love this character, that's America. That's who we really are. And so I think when... When, when we, we worry about those things too much, then we're worrying about them too much. If we're aware of them and we're sensitive to them, then I think that's the right way to look at it. You know? so, so I think that's a very, very good question because you're right. I would go, hey, did you already see all the top Native American actors for this? The ones that represent Two Blue. Uh, if you look in, uh, I think it's on, it might be on TikTok or maybe on YouTube, maybe on YouTube, but it's, it's performers, Latino performers that identify Native American. Somebody made a little, but I think Selena is in there as well, is it, because I think she has Apache blood as well, being it, from it, the. It, it's interesting. Uh, I think it's more so a pushback of the long, long legacy of Hollywood of having white actors play play non-white roles because there's, yeah. there's not really conversation about Latino actors maybe playing a, a other ethnic roles or black actors playing other ethnic roles. But there's a big pushback against white actors. But if you look back on films, like it's cringeworthy looking at like Breakfast at Tiffany's or um, like J John Wayne playing Genghis Khan or all the Charlie Chan films. You know, it's it's, it's how bad. about how about Brando as Emilio, Emilio Zapata? <laughs> Um, I, I want to give a, give a chance for some people who haven't had a, a chance to talk yet. So Joyce or Michael or Chris or Mary Jane or Heidi, do do any of you have questions for Jesse? Heidi, who's uh, that next to you? This is a cutie. That's who's Olivia. That you, Heidi. Hi, mommy daughter. Hi, <laughs> mommy daughter. <laughs> I've got a good movie that I was in that you could watch. Okay, are you ready? It's called Scooby-Doo and the Monster of Mexico. Whoa. We it will comes check that out. Halloween. <laughs> when you hear my, when your mom Rick hears it and hears my voice, she's going to say, there's that weird guy that you saw on the computer. <laughs> Olivia cool, just huh? turned a couple of weeks ago. So, <laughs> here, here. so uh, Michael, it looked like you had a question. Uh, more. I had a question, but I, I got caught up in this discussion that I, I just kind of wanted to comment on that instead. Um, I watched uh, a Japanese film. It was the most recent Japanese Godzilla movie. I think it was from 2016 called Shin Godzilla. And one of the characters was supposed to be a Japanese American girl. Her grandmother was Japanese, but that was about it. But of course, since this is a Japanese film, she's portrayed by a full Japanese woman. And, you know, obviously, if I was Japanese, I probably wouldn't think on it too much. But as an American viewer, it was a little funny. Like, I could kind of look past it and understand why it turned out that way. But I think the biggest kick I got out of it is they, they kind of just gave her a leather, jacket, a leather jacket and told her to act a little more rude than usual. That was seemed to be her <laughs> acting direction. And I thought that was hilarious that that was her. That's how she portrayed an American woman. <laughs> That's hilarious. How did you know she wasn't uh, American? Uh, if I remember right, I, I pretty much just IMDb'd it. I think she's a, a pop idol of some kind, and that's part of how she got the part. And I actually – I used to read a lot of these comments uh, because a lot of uh, a lot of Americans will uh, be upset when they cast uh, – like a, a white actor in like an anime film adaptation, but a lot of the, the Japanese – um, comments that I read, the a lot of the Japanese fans of the anime, they just are happy they didn't pick some pop idol 
again, I guess. So apparently that's kind of a common practice in their part is for the the pop idols to get the roles. And they actually kind of like when the uh, white American actors get those roles, which I think is the interesting. The reality of it is YouTubers, uh, TikTok influencers, Instagram, those guys are all the new stars. Actors are obsolete. I trained for years and these YouTubers, that's what they want, these kids. So ultimately you're gonna see a hodgepodge. I mean, I'm waiting for these K-pop guys to star in an American television series. It's gonna happen, you know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I agree, I see it coming I too. American Korean actors are gonna go, what, what the hell, what about us? <laughs> so, and the, kind of the same thing happened with the Mexican American actors because remember a large there's a large Mexican American population in Los Angeles so they've grown up around in and around Hollywood you know uh, and so when uh, the Latino stories finally came to fruition all of a sudden they started going to Mexico to find their filmmakers and their actors <laughs> uh, <no. laughs> so they overstepped us and they went well we're gonna we're going to bring the Latin flavor in, but it's coming from Mexico. And the Mexican filmmakers are the new hot guys. So we kind of got looked over and went, wait a minute. But, you know, as an artist, I don't really see color that way. I see color. Uh, and I think, again, that's coming from the theater. I came from a theater that was very rich and filled with color. But in a town like San Antonio that overlapped with every other culture, the theater culture, you know, uh, the uh, the East Side, which was African American and their cultural center, and the West Side, which was Latino and, and Chicano. Uh, and so I kind of like grew up in this kind of reality where everything counted. I, I, I didn't see racism that way. I understood it and I understood the systematic part of it, but I also understood that on the ground, if we didn't buy into it, which an artistic society kind of doesn't, that we were all, we recognized that we were all under the creator. And that just gave me a great uh, base. So that when I did get into the industry and I really saw the glass ceiling and I saw, you know, uh, cultural prejudice in terms of what stories were being told and how, what types of characters you know, after I spent the early, late 80s and early 90s playing these wonderful characters, in 1994, when my daughter was four or five years old, I thought to myself, huh, if my daughter asks me, Daddy, what were you doing when I was four years old, five years old? And I look back and I show her my body of work and, I, and there's all these drug dealers and I, I think I had just come back from an audition where I felt very bad. And they're drug dealers and they're gang members and they're narco kings and they're growlers and they're, you know, you know, uh, you know, motorcycle gang, la, 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 on and on and on. And at that time in the mid 90s, uh, that's all there was for Latino actors. And again, this is after having been on a great show like Fame, having done great movies like New York Stories, la, la, la. This is the type of stuff that was coming down the pipeline. I decided, you know what, I've, I've got young fans from fame and I've got a young daughter. I am not going to necessarily play these characters anymore. So when I did that, then all of a sudden there were no auditions because there really wasn't any other type of character being written. Uh, so I think you have to have some sort of root into who you want to be and what you want to say. So then you wait, you wait and beautiful characters like Carlos and Phoenix, Oregon come around, Tecumseh, you know, Danny, the court was talking about on Lone Star. So you're, you, you kind of take it as it is as an artist and you appreciate it then when those, when those moments come. Um, that, that being said though, Jesse, I will say some of those characters that you played in the early nineties that were a little bit more gangsterish though, um, like I, I personally love, and I think it's such a landmark film. Me, uh, me, me be, be the loca. Um, your character is a total badass in that film. Plus, the car that you drive is sweet. Uh, but, but uh, uh, you're you're right. When you look back on that era, a lot of those roles were limiting, except for the handful of films you can look at. Like, this with Wolves would be a great example of a time when a Native American role came up that wasn't like typical old style Western of that era. And then Mi Vida Loco being a film that showed 
Latinos that wasn't just like LA East Side stereotype. From a feminist point of view, that was Alison Anders, man. Gas, food, and lodging. Uh, Grace is my heart. You know, that's uh, Alison Anders. So she was, and I had just done Blood and Blood Out, which was the other side, right? The hyper male side. So I wanted to, but again, it's like Carlos. I can play those characters if I'm in control of making them three-dimensional people. You know, this guy was hard on the outside. He was a gangster, but he was in love with this woman and he was writing her Pablo Neruda poetry, you know, on the other side. So he was this sweet romantic guy who was really a Lothario, you know, he was caught in his Lothario, you know, persona. And so what a great character for me to play, you know, so even, so even those type of gangster characters, I was in control of them and I was able to show them as real people. And that's what I always tell people, like, oh, look, the thing is, let me tell you a story about the drug trade in Mexico. I'll bet you it'll be a story you never heard and you're going to hear things that are going to shock you because the real story has nothing to do with what you think it is. The people that are suffering on the ground are real people like you and me, you know? And so that, but see, that is not an interesting narrative. You know, it doesn't fit the, the, the boogeyman narratives. It doesn't. And so for me, I already know, oh, projects that have that as the narrative are not for me. So I already know when I see a narco series or some type of series like that, that I'm not going to work because I'm not interested in feeding that narrative anymore. Is it exciting? Sure. Does it look beautiful? Yes. They make those people look like they're incredibly beautiful and romantic, but is the story authentic to what I want to say? You know, what's uplifting, you know, Phoenix, Oregon was uplifting. You know, you look at Carlos, you, everybody says, I have a friend like Carlos. I want a friend like Carlos, you know? And, and so it makes that tragic main character, Bobby, it uplifts the story because Bobby's a real doubter when you look at Phoenix Oregon, you know, he's that side of us that wants to give up when we hit that midlife crisis, you know, we've all felt that. So I think that you need that Carlos, you know what I mean? But as actors, what a joy as actors of color who say no and spend most of their careers being unemployed to be able to just tell a story, you know? I mean, I'm so proud of that film that I could show it to Heidi's daughter there, you know? And I'd be, I'd be happy to have her watch it with her family. So it's those types of things that I think you, you wait for as an actor, you know, uh, and as an artist. That's, that's uh, uh, Olivia. They're, they're checking in from my, uh, my living room. So. <laughs> Olivia? Her name is Olivia? That, that's uh, Olivia and Heidi. Um, we, we have a house together, so. Okay, so Olivia was my grandmother's name, and it's also my goddaughter's name. Olivia. Wow, that is so cool. <laughs> so, um, Joyce or Christopher or Mary Jane or Heidi, since um, you haven't had a chance to ask a question, is there something you'd like to talk to Jesse about? My movies say it all. <laughs> Jay, just making sure everyone gets a chance to, to chime in we of course appreciate so much the time and, and the candor uh and, and the input this is tons of fun thank you jesse so much Joyce, did, did you have something you want to say i just wanted to tell jesse how much i really enjoyed him in the phoenix oregon film it was incredible and you and james were so awesome in your parts and when i left there i wanted to go have pizza yeah <laughs> what's the recipe <laughs> yeah i want the recipe exactly i tell it i tell everybody joyce i tell everybody when they're wa before that if they haven't seen the film right i go go see phoenix oregon and then oh by the way order pizza they look at me like huh oh yeah exactly. we're, we're gonna fix it i go no Order pizza because by the end of the movie right. you're going to want it. So <laughs> your acting in that part was exceptional, and thank you. I really enjoyed it. Well, you know, when you have a good writer like Gary, and you know the type of crew that they had there in Oregon, these young people that Annie and Gary got together, and really the community in Klamath, 
you know, all of the restaurants that, that fed us, all the people that took care of us. It was such a, the hotel staff, man, everybody was just so loving to us that it just made going to work and creating you know so much fun so i think that's what you see on the screen all of that love that was coming from there you know going every day and hanging out with barry at that at that at that bowling alley man, i miss it it was just such a hoot and and so i was so glad that we were able to represent him in that way because he's got a class he's got a class place so you know that's that's the give back of it you know so i think that's what you see, all that love you see in those characters and in right, that story. It comes through. <laughs> comes through. It, doesn't always on an, it doesn't always on an independent budget. <laughs> it doesn't always come through, but I think that one really did. Thank you yeah, so much. Appreciate it. Uh, Mary Jane or Heidi, did you have questions? I don't have any questions. I just wanted to say I really enjoyed tonight. It was fun to listen to you. Thanks. Thank you for inviting. Thank you for inviting. And watch Follow Me Home. So go to followmehomethemovie.com. Ah, okay. Thanks. They're going to show a trailer, but then it'll tell you there when the film is actually going to stream. Ah. It stars me, Benjamin Bratt, Alfre Woodard, uh, Steve Rivas, uh, the big Indian from Fargo, talking about Native Americans. Uh, Salma Hayek plays my ex-girlfriend in a cameo. Ah, awesome. It's a beautiful film. It was a, it was the it was the hit of the 1995 Sundance Film Festival. Ah, okay. Yeah, sounds good. Follow me. <laughs> Follow me home. I just wrote that down. <laughs> Chris or Hayek, if there's something you wanted to ask as we start to kind of wrap things up in about the next 10, 15 minutes. What about Kurt? He just came back in. Or, or court since we just come back in. Cal Arshin, brother. <laughs> Are you still doing music? I just thank you for coming. It's been, it's been great to listen to you. Are you still doing music? Uh, yeah, I'm guilty of that. Oh, uh, good. You doing music for, uh, for uh, soundtracks and stuff? Uh, I'm working my way into it. I just picked it, picked it back up uh, a couple of years ago. All you filmmakers on the on the uh, Klamath Hills, uh, you need a soundtrack guy. He's right there. Court. He studied at Cal Art. That's one of the best schools. Uh, I went to school with Andrew Stanton, Tim Burton, some of the best. And in the music school, some heavies went through the Cal Arts Music School. So, yeah, Dave Warner was there when I was there. Yep. Yeah, Dave Warren. We, we have a, a great partnership with Court. He actually provides discount services to any filmmakers that are kind of film members for, for, uh, for sound. Uh, I always um, the importance of, of audio because when I was in LA, I spent a few years working as a music supervisor. So uh, yeah. I, I got music for trailers, films, TV shows, and nothing can kill a film project faster than having the wrong music. Exactly. I'm actually, uh, yeah. I'm actually dealing with a film that I shot a while back, and again, they they didn't do right on the audio, and so I'm having to go back and fix it all. But yeah. the film itself is great, but it's the only thing that makes it unwatchable. So, yep, I know exactly mm -hmm. what you do. All right, Court, way to do that, man. These filmmakers, like in places like Cabin Falls, they need that type of support and resource. Mm -hmm. Chris or Heidi, is there something you wanted to chime in with? Uh, I don't think we have any questions or anything, but I, I mean, and I was there so that at the Phoenix, Oregon, and so just hearing you and everything, and Kurt and I actually laugh quite a bit about it, because it's like, oh, well, if Jesse's on a call, you can throw him one question and he'll talk to you. You know, you're not going to have to worry about it. <laughs> but I, I, so, I so appreciate you just, I mean, I'm from, I'm born and raised from a fault, so I'm seen all of the, these changes and everything over the last 40 some years. And so it, it's so nice to have a champion for us with, you know, the filmmaking and to bring more things to our little town. And it just, you know, so basically, thank you so much for taking the time and for promoting, you know, our little town that we love so much. 
Well, Klamath Falls took care of me while we were making this wonderful film that I still celebrate. Uh, and so to me, the fact that I can give it back that way is wonderful. I'm so happy uh, that it did so well, number one, in a very difficult time, right? It uplifted people's spirits uh, when the actual town of Phoenix. So think about that. Klamath Falls, by helping us create this film, gave to Phoenix, Oregon when it actually got burned. So you guys are responsible for helping that community there. What a give give in terms of Oregon love. You see what I'm saying? So to me, to be a part of that is incredible. Uh, so I think that that I, I think that that's that love that Klamath Falls gave to us while we were there. Um, my raccoon friends, I had a lot of raccoon friends there uh, in that because you guys have a big raccoon population. <laughs> I love them though, they're real. And I, I was like, whoa, I love my raccoons. And so uh, that, that yeah. incredible energy is, 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 is all about in giving back. So I think that's what you feel there. On foothills like every single day. So, uh, yeah. um, that's my raccoons. Just, uh, across your vast career of so many films and TV shows, I'm kind of curious. I ask this question a lot to actresses who have kind of been there, done that. So we always get a great response. What is the weirdest direction that you've ever received from a director? <laughs> Or what's the craziest behind the scenes thing that, that's happened that you can talk about? You can laugh about now, but at the time we're like, oh crap, how are we going to pull this project off? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. I was talking to James Ivory, Academy Award winning director, who's from Klamath Falls. And he was talking about a movie he was making in India, and his lead actor got arrested on the first day of filming and <laughs> in prison. And they were trying to, to figure out how many shots can we shoot right now that don't have our lead actor while we negotiate. <laughs> have, have you been involved in anything super crazy on, on set that you can look back at the time now and laugh, but at the time you're like, what the hell's going on? Yeah, man. Uh, I don't know if anybody saw that. Uh, it just got nominated along with 24 other films, including Selena for a registry into the uh, National Library of Congress, but it's called Blood In, Blood Out. It was a film that I did with, uh, that Taylor Hackford directed, right? Academy Award winning officer and a gentleman, Taylor Hackford, uh, who also produced La Bamba. Well, there was a scene where I'm a painter and I'm making this big, incredible, very complicated painting. And my brother, who I haven't seen for five years since I accidentally killed our little brother on a heroin overdose, so he's mad at me, he shows up after not, and I'm all strung out and I'm in a horrible mood and he can't believe it. He can't believe that I've gone so far downhill. And he sees that in our paintings, because I'm so guilty about my little brother's death, I keep putting him in our paintings, right? Trying to work out my demons. Well, he comes in and he lets me have it. And he goes, hey, and another thing, quit working your, your crap out on on the painting, quit painting your little brother, quit putting our little brother in your paintings. And I look at him and I go, really? And I grab a knife and I cut the face out of my little brother. It's a very dramatic scene, you know, beautiful, you know, long scene, the whole bit. Well, when I walked onto the set, right? And I know filmmaking. So I walked onto the set and I know Taylor Hackford had been doing about, averaging about 20, 25 takes per yeah. shot, right? He was, he was doing, yeah, he was shooting a lot. I walked on and there was a lady up on a scaffold and she's working on the big painting, right? And I say, wow, this is beautiful. She goes, yeah. I go, how many copies did you make? She goes, oh my God, it's so elaborate in the time frame, I could only make one. And I went, uh, you know, I have to cut it, right? She goes, I know, but this, and I, I, so I go to Taylor and I go, Taylor, Taylor, she made one painting, brother. What the hell? This is a dramatic scene. All kinds of stuff could go wrong. There's choreography. There's knife cutting. I go, he goes, oh, well, you better get it right the first time. Oh, well, are you serious? So I had to pull out all of my, so I, all of a sudden, you know, I went from being a happy camper to, oh, oh my God. So I just had to get all of my, I had to get all of my um, theater training, right? where you can't, there's no cut. So if you're, you're on stage, 
if you drop the knife, then you better pick it up because there's <laughs> there's nothing, there's no one to help you. So I so I said uh, so I went over to Ben and I said, look, it's a very complicated scene, dude, but they only made one of these. There's a small close up that they're gonna shoot, but you know you want to see me actually throwing the knife in there, so that I'm only gonna get a chance to do it once. I go, let's do the scene. We'll we'll go through it. If I think that it's not good before I stab it. I'm going to call cut because I want us to be in the groove when I do it. He goes, Ben, I'm with you. We nailed it the first take. The one right. you see in the movie was the one they used. Wow. So, right. but I just remember going from, yeah, Mr. Happy Go Lucky, oh, I'm in control of this character to like, oh my God, I get one chance to do this right. Well, you know, that, that does come up from time to time. I, you know, you think of like big action films with like huge explosions. Of course, you were in one in, in Con Air, movie deaths of all time, getting blown up by a cigar. Um, but uh, uh, something like I don't know. Um, I guess the the Dark Knight is a good example. You know, if they screw that up, you can't unblow up a hospital. You know, they <laughs> no, in Con Air they blew up. In Con Air they blew up the sands. They really blew up the sands. Yeah. So you know, yeah, there was a couple of those. Uh, there was a couple of those seeds they couldn't recreate. Man, they were really gonna blow up. They really blew up the sands. So that's that's incredible. No, but I think you know, filmmaking has changed though. That's why I tell you, it's no longer uh, it's IP content. So in that digital world, you know, you're gonna you're gonna be able to recreate anything without actually doing. You know, those, I think those days of the big blockbuster stunts and explosions is dead because you can literally fake all of that. I, you know, I've been watching Chinese cinema and I mean, they do incredible stuff, but you can tell that it's all green screen, that it's all created, the explosions, the fights, the, you know, the, the incredible visuals. So I think that's where it's all heading. You know, SAG just had this big workshop for us actors where they were explaining to us that the new digital rights are this thing called volume capture. I don't know if you guys have heard it, but volume capture is where they 360 you, capture you. Now they can put you in any movie. They can have you say anything. You can do, and you never, the actor never has to lift another finger. But it brings up the issue of digital rights for an actor, right? How is my image being exploited? So it was based around the union. But the dudes who are doing it were chiming in, the production companies. So as a producer and as a filmmaker, I was already going, oh, this is the new thing. You know what I mean? So you have to kind of think like that and realize that uh, you, as, as creators and as creatives, uh, you know, the, it's a whole Pandora's box out there. So it's really going to be, you know, du jour. It's going to be whatever you want and however you want. Like I tell you, it's going to be, are you going to feel comfortable with watching Pirates of the Caribbean in 3D in, in your living room, dancing around? You know, it's going to feel weird, you know, that you might get into it. I can't get into the whole 3D goggles thing full immersion. That's too much for me. You know, I like my movies flat. I like them two-dimensional. <laughs> That's no, it. About 25 yeah. years ago, I was in Salt Lake City, and I saw an early demonstration of the 3D walk-around. It was pretty oh, awesome 25 years ago. Awesome. Yeah. It was in experimental phases, and it was just one person, but it was incredible to literally walk all the way around this thing, see it from every angle. The character was moving, uh, talking. I, I was blown out of the water. Yeah. And, uh, we're, we're starting to see more immersive films now, too. Like They had that hardcore Henry film that came out a couple of years ago that was all like first person where all you saw, like the camera was, all you saw was like the main character's hands. Mm -hmm. And then the camera was like the person's head. Mm -hmm. um, and just filmmaking in general seems to be a lot more immersive now. I talk about all the time. Heidi and I went to go see when it was in theaters. Oh, yeah. And the camera movements in that film, just how fluid it, it was. Um, the entire time I was sitting there shocked, like, how, how did they shoot that? And then two minutes later, how did they shoot that? How did they, how are they even manipulating the camera to get it so? It might, yeah. It's it's a whole other world. I'll I'll do you one further, man. Oh yeah, all, all the the all NFT stuff. Yes, oh. it's digital images that are locked to the blockchain technology of Bitcoin and all that. They just 
just sold an NFT uh, digital print for like millions. Uh, oh. Film's gonna go that way. You know what yeah. I mean? Because they're gonna play in that weird cyber world. So film is gonna go in that world. That's why I tell you, if film is obsolete, a term, it's gonna be content, IP, content, internet protocol content. It's a whole, but for us it's the same because it's still touring, storytelling, it's still theater. You know, uh, there was a whole kerfuffle with the unions, the two actors unions, which is Screen Actors Guild and Equity in the theater, because during the pandemic, a lot of theater people were pivoting to streaming their uh, performances. Well, SAG got all into uh, a bond because, wait a minute, that's our domain. And so then when they told Equity, hey, you got to make deals with us, Equity went, what? Never, who do you think you are? This is theater. You don't control the world. And so they got into this whole thing where for most of the pandemic, they were fighting about whose rights it was to stream theater pieces. Crazy, huh? Right. But I get to tell you that how the ideas are being thought of, it's changing. But for us, it's the same. If I can look at this, we just spent the whole couple of hours telling you listening to me tell you my stories right that's what it's about i think yeah i think it's about interactivity it's about the new theater you know uh the pandemic proved to us that we don't necessarily have to be in the same room to still keep sharing information you know uh and so i think that that to me is what's exciting you know because really realistically what's controlled and the reason as as extensive as my career has been I tell you, I've spent a lot more time saying no and being told no to than all of what you saw because I've been selected, but also because there hasn't been enough of the narrative that I can be a part of, you know? Uh, and so I think that uh, all of us have a story to tell. That's why I tell you, as people just visit from Plymouth Falls, there's stories there, there's, there's uh, narratives, there's information to be shared. And, and our and our love, if we're part of this film society, is that visual narrative. So that visual narrative exists on our phones. It exists everywhere around us now. Hey, Kurt, I'm about to run out of power, so yeah, I want to talk about the middle of a sentence. Yeah, your 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 phone's cutting out too. Um, and it's eight o'clock anyway. Jesse, thank you so much for being a part of this. This was so much fun. We really appreciate it. We'd love to have you back again sometime, maybe next year. It was absolutely incredible. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I'm any to final thoughts? Okay. Jesse, are the negotiations longer now? Do you have to worry about uh, your image and voice in future uses and, or uh, peripheral use in uh, productions? Uh, not at not at the layman's level. Probably at the big time, uh, uh, big star level. Yeah, because they can negotiate for everything. But now nah, at our level, the union figures out, you know, how to cover us and all that. So yeah, they'll start to get detailed. They'll put all that wording into the new contracts. Okay. Okay. Great. Well, Richard and Joyce. And uh, husband, sorry, I forgot your name. Michael, uh, Court, Mary Jane, Heidi, Tom, David, Laura, and on behalf of uh, everyone here, Jesse, thank you so much for being a part of this. This was incredible. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, so and uh, hopefully we'll see you again sometime down the road. Down the road. Thank you, guys. Night. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, guys. Loved it. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>